Good evening, everyone. While I wait for everything technology-wise to get up and running, uh, raise your hands if you're, you've started a business. Yes, awesome. Everyone else is in a business incubator, something like that. Raise your hands. Cool. And everyone else just wants to hear about business? No? Okay, I don't know. Everyone else is like, whatever, I need some time to just pass time today. All right, let's make it interesting. <laughs> let's talk about something. I, uh, my name is Jasky, and um, I'm, ve I'm very excited. I firstly want to thank Bloom and everyone inviting me to speak here. I'm honored to come back to where I graduated from, but they decided to put me in the place where I wasted more time than anywhere else. I spent five and a half years, and 95% of the time I was a pool shark up there attending no fucking lectures. It was valuable use of my hex. What a waste of time, but I loved it. Um, all right, I'm gonna talk about four major categories, and I hope, honestly, hope at the end of this, you're welcome to interrupt me. If something is valuable, ask me something, just pause, say, hey, look, I want you to expand. The only reason I'm here is hopefully it's valuable to you guys with the business you've started, anyone that's an incubator and other people that just love hearing about business and didn't want to tune into Gary Vee on YouTube. Um, I am going to talk about the theme, which is going to be commit. Now, I hope, I'm going to say it so many times that I hope it sinks in because, look, I don't, I don't know what's right. I don't know the answer. No one knows the business journey. Um, how, how deep you, are you into your business journey? Seven years. What, what, are, you, what are you doing? Event, event production. Yep, and you're, you're going well, happy? Yeah, yeah, COVID's been a great instigator for business. Awesome, so anyone that's on their journey or along their journey will know they go through a different path, right? And I think if you can just embed one word into your mind, which really helped me, is the word commit. And I'll, and I'll go through that many times. I'll obviously give you my background. I'll tell you my biggest fuck up. <laughs> Being in business for as long as I have, it is a plethora of fuck ups. Um, so if I was just gonna tell you stories, um, this man's not interested, he's gone. Um, <laughs> thank you for coming. I, I would be here for a very long time, but I will try and give you some anecdotes and also some beliefs. And then I'll give you a framework which is hopefully valuable at the end of it. So first thing, which is a very relevant example of committing this event, this was the flyer, it's called the fuck up night. Yet this is how much the organizers have committed to that by putting an asterisk into the swear word. You either commit or you don't. Like you can't be provocative and then not fucking commit. It makes no sense. Um, you just Mark Manson the title. No one gets a Mark Manson reference, no. You read the book, subtle? No, anyway, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. Okay, I, <laughs> I'm gonna try and make this a talk that I wish I heard, right? When I started my journey, I honestly wish this is what someone told me because the single differentiator for any of you not having success in business, uh, a business getting derailed in any way, or you going into business and then bailing is gonna be the word commit and commit not for persistence, conviction, putting your effort in, it's gonna be the fact that there's other uh, inputs from your family, from your friends, from judgment of others, from putting something out and someone going, oh dude, that was so stupid, why did you do that? And then you quit, right? All of that is gonna be way more of a factor and for me, that came from my parents, my friends, and being coming to Australia at a time where it was very different, the world, and I will get into that, but honestly, I, I think, the thing I needed to hear back then, and I would have had a lot of less fuck ups maybe, um, is to know that all the incoming judgments and comments and, and, and people trying to derail you to go down their path is what you need to try and prevent as much as possible. And I love this quote, and it's probably the only quote I can find of David Goggins that is not uh, punctuated with as many swear words as possible and it is called, don't stop when you're tired, stop when you're done. And that can also be reworded to don't stop when you've tried, stop when you're done. Okay, and tired doesn't mean physically exhausted, it means tired from all the stuff you're gonna have to navigate with all the people saying the various things that are gonna make it very challenging for you to get what you need to get done. 
Preaching is over. Let me give you some background. I have said my name twice. Uh, again, it's Jasky, just in case you didn't know. Um, when I started my journey um, more than a decade ago, my literally, this is embarrassing, but my literally only dream was to become a millionaire. That was it. I didn't care what it was. I would have sold drugs. Um, would have walked the streets of Northbridge late at night. Didn't matter. I just wanted to be a millionaire. That was it. And in 2021, uh, my portfolio of businesses hit a million dollars a month over the year, right? Which was an exciting moment for me. But at the same time, sh sharing that fact with people either creates anger in people, creates skepticism, because people throw out figures and go, oh, this guy's talking bullshit. It's another one of those internet marketing courses people is going to sell me some shit at the end of it. But I hope what it does outside of all of the stuff is just inspire you. Because I am someone that has no skills. Honestly, I literally have no skills and I realized what changed dramatically for me was just the commitment. And it was a framework that I followed diligently, which I learned many years into the, the journey and I'm going to share it with you at the end. I hope it's valuable. Uh, and I just wanted to inspire you even if you're skeptical and you're angry, right? All those emotions are probably good to inspire you in the end anyway. So if you see 10 years ago, that was a business that I started. I don't know, the image might be small, but we were working on garden chairs. That was our boardroom to the right. So if a client came in, they thought this was a, a dope boardroom. Um, <laughs> the other one was our theater room and we stacked a bunch of projectors in the theater room, which was also a makeshift office. It was uh, the, the true garage story. And today we invested $500 in the business uh, judging from the demographic, the one business you probably know of that I'm an owner in is Butterfly 73, which is a nightclub on Francis Street. And if any of you haven't frequented there, you must go um, because I want your money. Uh, also, <laughs> it's the best place to go. So where the fuck else are you going to go? Um, also, the main business that I started first was the audio visual business, which is K2 Audio Visual, which is now the largest AV provider in Western Australia. Butterfly 73 is the uh, most popular nightclub that has the aggregate number of people through the door each week. Also had an investment in a Malaysian bar, which we exited last year, thanks to COVID, because um, Malaysia is not as easy to navigate as Perth in, during COVID. 2K Audio is an electronic, uh, uh, electronics manufacturer, predominantly audio equipment and some other businesses. So six active businesses in a portfolio under K1 Investments, that's the umbrella company. We now have 30 full-time staff across all these businesses. Uh, but what else do I do in the evenings? I love doing stand-up comedy. It is an obsession of mine. Um, that is an image of me uh, doing performing at the Regal Theatre with my friend here is also the videographer, Tim. We sold out Regal Theatre. It was uh, one of the most enjoyable uh, nights doing stand-up um, before my our friend COVID came along. And the other one is my insanity where I make TikToks and annoy people every day. Good shit. Okay, now how did I get there? Uh, is in 1994, my family, I'm a first generation immigrant. My family migrated from India to Australia in 1994. And the only reason I mention that is uh, twofold. Number one is in four generations of my family, there are zero business people, none. And that's not even the straight lineage. That's one degree of separation. No one knows anything business. So I couldn't really ask anyone. It was the strangest thing for migrant parents for someone to want to do. They were like, are you, do we need a DNA check? Where are you from? This makes no sense. You fucking weirdo. Um, and at the same time, I was the only brown person amongst one other person in my entire primary school. At that time, now there's a lot of, a lot of brown people in, in, in Australia, but at that time, we were the only two in, in, in the entire school. So no business background, no other people that are relatable that I'm trying to sell to, which you need in business, you, you're, you're standing out. I felt like it might've been easier to tell my parents I was gay. Mom and dad, I wanna start business. What? No, actually I'm just gay. Oh, phew, I was about to have a heart attack. It's a different world. Um, now, I 
want to explain to you that it's, this is my biggest fuck up and I'm not going to give you a, a, I'll give you anecdotes, like this is the point of the event to tell, share stories of fuck ups, but one thing I really want to drive home is coming from a migrant family, I had to navigate the, the global fuck up of not being able to develop that level of conviction to do something because my parents, um, there's a few migrants in here, I know you can probably relate, finish school and then do what you want. So I did, I finished school. Get a degree, then do what you want. I came here, studied electrical engineering and computer science for five and a half years, got a massive hex bill. Then I was like, can I do what I want? No, get a job and then do what you want. So I got a job at a, at a, at a, at a big consultancy engineering firm called SKM, which was taken over by um, Jacobs. And now can I do what I want? No, now you've got financial stability, get financial independence and then do what you want. I was like, no, fuck this, I'm done, right? At that point, I decided to commit. But the problem was, I was scattered. This is, this is the main issue, because you're hedging your bets, you're always worrying whether, is this gonna work? Should I do this? Because I, if I commit 100%, it doesn't work, my parents are gonna be embarrassed, my friends are gonna think whatever, or you know, do I need to do four things at the same time? Um, what are, and, and I didn't know that you gotta ma marry your strengths to your market. I didn't know any of these things. So I started events organizing, just like you, my friend, we, I was doing that for a while, then I was um, doing music, then I started a video company, then I did a drafting business, literally anything that I thought would make me money. Like I said, drugs and walk in the streets was very close second, I was about to do that. I did all of the other stuff. But the problem was I didn't really have Direction, because there wasn't, firstly, business was not glorified like it is in 2022, right? It's not the thing that everybody wants to do. Like everybody's like, yeah, I'm an entrepreneur. It's a synonym for being unemployed. That's what it is in 2022. iPhone one hadn't come out when I started my first business, right? So there wasn't any Gary V motivation shit. I had none of that, right? No, you couldn't start a niche business on Instagram selling cat perms. You couldn't do any of these things, right? It was a very, very challenging time. For me, not, not for other people, maybe it was different, right? So I, I, this is the room, if you can see this image, oh, yes, I'm sure you can, um, which I spent years and hours and hours of my time, and it looked like the room of a serial killer because it was pages and pages of notes, quotes, anecdotes, stories, blue tacked onto the wall. So <laughs> I walked in there so I could see just crazy writings of a maniac every single day. And I just spent hours, this was in my parents' study room. I spent hours and hours just working on whatever. I literally never left the room. Um, and then when I decided to take a break and I went to New Zealand with my friends, the first thing my dad did was rip all that shit off. He was like, I'm getting rid of this because I can't do it while he's here. This is the only moment. Um, I was very, very, very pissed off. Um, but anyhow, I'm going to tell you a couple of anecdotes because when, regardless of committing, there is a lot of luck. There is a lot of other factors involved. So here's a couple of stories that I think were the hardest and most difficult fuck ups for me. The first one was my business partner's brother was some, someone we hired to work with us, we got him to quit his job. Our business was going well enough. We said, we can put you on the payroll. You can be our first employee. He was working for us full time. And day in, day out, whatever. We got to a moment where we could not make next week's payroll. We were in the red. We didn't have enough jobs. We just couldn't do it. I'd put all my savings in that I saved from engineering straight into the business. We still couldn't make payroll. My money had already gone. I had to pick up the phone and call one of our competitors because I didn't, he had, he had a mortgage, he had a family, he had shit to sort out. I called my competitor and said, hey, are you looking for work? I want to find work for one of our people. Because the niche industry, audiovisual, there's not many people hiring. That's the only option I had. And I think it's fate. Business, I feel like is a lot of, I don't, I don't know if I believe in fate, I don't know if you guys believe in fate, but a lot of moments are fateful. Because the moment I made that call, did the difficult thing, the next day we won the biggest job we'd ever won up until that point. 
and he has never left us since. He's one of our most valuable employees and has been with us since that moment. But I think the, the God of business wanted me to make that call. There are many times that it's gonna get very, very difficult. It's gonna get very difficult. And any of you that are getting into business, if you think you're gonna skip the wheat field, pick up flowers, you know, you know, cuddle babies, fucking none of that, all right? Get that out of your head. It's gonna to be tough. And it's gonna get so tough that there was one moment that I remember vividly. I didn't sleep for many hours in the night. I cried into my pillow. This is a grown man telling you this shit. And it's, and it's to put it in your head that now you watch YouTube and say, like, $100 million in 90 days. No fucking way, it's just garbage. You need to put in the work and it's gonna get very tough that you're gonna to wanna to quit, but you can cry because the next morning you'll get over it, right? But it's gonna to get tough and there was many moments that you have to face and tell yourself, I've committed and I'm gonna get through that. Oops, 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 oops. Okay, 2010, that's when I left, uh, sorry, 2008 when I left UWA, 2010, I quit engineering at SKM. Two years, I did not commit, I was just doing all that other stuff I told you about. And then in 2012, I founded K2 Audiovisual with the $500. And it took five years from quitting engineering to 2015 till I crossed the minimum tax threshold. Let that sink in, five years. The minimum tax threshold is fuck all, right? So it took a lot of time, and I put money in the business. So it takes, it's, it's not only psychological commitment, it's gotta be financial commitment, you gotta believe in doing it, and it takes a lot of time. Luckily for me, I had wonderful parents that were willing to support me even though I, I was the insane kid for that period of time. And that time the commitment meant 100% work. I loved it. I just worked 16, 18 hours a day. I would minimize social shit. I barely you know, saw my friends. They just thought I died. Um, I didn't watch many, much TV. There wasn't Netflix, so there wasn't much to watch. Um, and I did the hard stuff. This is the thing. Everyone will want to do the easy stuff and consider it being work. I'll make a fancy website. I'll put some new business cards together. I'll design a fancy flyer. I'll make some kind of cool garbage, right? The main stuff, pick up the phone, make the calls every single day. I did 20 calls a day, every single day, and kept doing it till maybe last year. It was nonstop. Every single day, make calls, send emails, generate clients, because that's the you gotta put the hard stuff first. What is it? Eat the frog. Eat the frog in the morning. And then 2015 is when things turned around and has been upwards and positive ever since. Um, I think the foundation was laid and then the work grew from there. Um, it was the exciting moment when we got our first office, which now looks like a shed and a very uh, strange venue for an AV business. But we finally got our office we had our first shipment of the speakers we manufactured, which you'll see on your left. And on the, the right, on the left, no, sorry, on the right, on the left is the, uh, the bare bones gauntlet of the Indian telemarketing office we had, um, where you walk in and you're confronted by six people looking directly at you. Um, it, was, it was our office, we didn't care. There was barely anything in there, but we were very, very happy. That was the moment I knew something was happening for me. I could, I could do this for a career. And today that's our office again, we've outgrown it. We're about to move. This, was our, this is currently our office in Willerton. In two months, we're moving to another uh, standalone premises. Before I get into the framework, the, my biggest fuck up, I know I've already told you many things. My biggest fuck up is you're in, insane until you're successful. And my mom passed away when I was still insane. That's my biggest fuck up and the thing, if I had committed earlier, maybe she would have seen me at the stage of successful. All right, I'm gonna end with this framework. This is mine, you can take it with a grain of salt, digest it, throw it out in the bin, whatever. But I hope it's, it's valuable in some some frame of mind. I'm happy to email and share it to you if, you if you find it at all useful. All right, I am jumping out of that talk and I am now here with the framework in front of me and I want to do it in a focused setting because I feel like this is the cornerstone of the entire talk and I really want to punch it in 
if you've got to this point, I, I want to make sure that I get the details out, which I didn't have the time to do um, in the talk itself. So if you can see this slide in front of you, there are four main facets to commitment. And before I even jump into them, I do want to preface it by saying this is my framework. This is a framework that I've created. So take it with a grain of salt. Uh, like I said, I'm no expert. I don't have any skills. This is just what's worked for me. So, so, so digest it, treat it like some entertaining piece of information. If it doesn't work for you, just throw it in the bin. Now, let's begin. When I say commit, the first thing that comes to someone's mind, the first thing you think of is conviction. And hence, that is the the first part of this framework and, the, and probably the most important because the person with the most conviction, so if you can work on your level of conviction, you win that argument, you win that transaction, you win that sale. It's like when you speak to those ridiculous people with us with some strange niche belief um, or some conspiracy but they come in so hot so convinced so adamant that what they believe is correct you start to doubt your own shit you start to think maybe this person is is telling me something that is probably correct and i should i should i should take note that's purely conviction and conviction is not transactional just in sales. That's conviction when talking to your wife. If you say something convincing enough, she will kick you out of the house, but <laughs> you will win that transaction. Um, and it comes with confidence. So you, you, if you have confidence in what you believe, you, you will have conviction. And results. So if you've had previous positive results that you can leverage to then as a cycle give you more confidence which then gives you more conviction it, it all flows into each other to, to, to strengthen your conviction I, I've just said conviction many times but I think you get what I'm talking about the second part of the framework is uh, to commit your strengths need to line up with the market uh, this one's a bit of a dichotomy because if a market is a, a blossoming a growing, a just just a gangbuster market, then it doesn't really matter how skilled you are. You could you could be selling uh you could be selling a jacket outside of a an igloo, and doesn't you don't have to be the greatest salesperson. If someone's cold as shit, they'll buy that jacket, right? But ideally, where I have seen results is where you have a skill set, you have some strength, something you're really good at. You know, I'm I'm currently staring at shrubbery. Let's say you're an incredible, uh, uh, you manicure gardens really well. That's one of your strengths, and there is currently a a market for beautiful manicuring of hedges. You know, like people just want the the, the top of the hedges to look beautiful. I don't know, stupid example, but you get it, right? If your strength lines up with the market, then that is. You can commit because you know your strength is is designed for that market, and the market has has demand, and 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 you can you can you can benefit from it. There are four ways to identify what a good market essentially is. There is enough pain. There are a lot of people that feel like their hedges are not well manicured. There is enough pain that you can solve that problem. Purchasing power. Do these people that want a well manicured hedge? have the ability to pay do they have money that they can spend like you don't want to go into a market of selling to open my comedians they don't have any purchasing power they have no money you no matter how great your product is they have absolute peanuts to pay for it right uh the third facet is are they easy to target can you target this market easily if i'm sticking to my ridiculous example which i'm now committed to i'm going to commit 100 percent on is the manicured hedges that is your niche. If 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 there is a a Facebook group of hedge manicuring enthusiasts, you know you can easily target them, right? That is a, a, a way. No matter how good a market, how, sorry, how how much of a pain point there is, how much purchasing power these people have, but if you're not able to target them without uh, elaborate efforts, or you have to fragment your efforts in many different directions, then it's probably not. Um, the best market to be in or it's it's going to be a, a tougher challenge and growing ideally is there are, are there more people out there now that want to manicure the hedges to uh 
to be shaped like a like a mushroom. Uh, you know, whatever. If that's a thing that's happening and you're seeing it happen more often, more people are searching for it. There is a trend that you're, you're driving through uh, Dow Keith and the expensive suburbs and now you're saying, wow, there's a lot of mushroom hedges around here. This shit is popping, right? So then you then you know that that is a growing market. All right, enough on that uh, on that section. To commit as your third part of this framework is you need to put in work, but work like a professional. The easiest way to think of this and the question that I always ask me is, how would an athlete treat this? Do that. Why athletes? Because athletes find one uh, small part of their game, one one lacking skill set, one, one area. And they go, this is something I, I need to work on. This is a micro skill. Uh, this is a micro weakness, right? And I, and I diligently practice every single moment uh, and focus on improving that. Once that's improved, that constraint has now been overcome. I'm going to go on to the next thing. Awesome. That's been done. Moving on. And, and, and when you frame it as an athlete, because everyone knows athletes to be at that level must really niche down, must really focus on, on one particular area. Once they overcome it, they can move on to the next. Um, hence, you must work hard, but work hard like a professional, meaning identify what needs to be done, the hard work, do the hard things first, um, because as many times you can sit there and think you're busy and you're actually doing work, but all you're doing is designing fancy flyers and great presentations like I've got in front of you, which can be an absolute fucking waste of time. And you're not actually treating it like a professional. You need to know, hey, I can't make cold calls in this area very well. My script sucks. My script is my weakness. Boom, 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 target, target, target. My script is now spot on and I am working at it like a professional. And the example I have here before I move on to the last section is you can see those those uh, corner cafes and you think these people have been doing this for 10 years or a deli or some 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 random business that's been going on for 10 years and they're essentially doing the same things just keeping the neck, neck above water the head above water and you wonder why is that the case the reason that's the case is because they're not identifying weaknesses not identifying constraints not identifying the things that can make their business better and not working on it like an athlete the final facet of this commitment framework, which uh, which I, which is which is my illustrious framework, is integrity, and integrity means my reputation is more valuable than money. You can always cut a relationship, cut a connection, cut a network, a networking opportunity to build a, a, a deep connection with a client or or have strong reputation for the future by going for the money in the short term. And you can shoot yourself in the foot because that person, that that word of mouth, that connection is going to be a lot more valuable to you in many years time. And I'll give you an example that will put this into perspective. So there was uh, Fiona Stanley Hospital, one of the biggest hospital developments in in uh, in Western Australia at the time. It was one of the biggest audiovisual projects. We were too small and it was just a ridiculous it was a ridiculous thought that we that I believed at the time that we could pitch for this project. Now, obviously, they wanted expressions of interest, and I was very good at at spinning the truth, right? So the truth was we shouldn't be we should we didn't uh, qualify for a lot of the criteria, but you know I I wrote it in a way that I didn't lie because I was always moralistic in the fact that I didn't want to lie, but it was creative, it was it was fiction, right? I was. I wasn't lying, but I was I was extending reality and going, yeah, well, we've done this, but it was working with a company that had done those projects and we hadn't. Um, we have these criteria, but we were partnered with a company that had that criteria. So ticked all the boxes and we got in to the final panel where I, uh, I, I met someone uh, who was one of the assessors of that project who was going to be awarded to a particular vendor. Um, and he realized that this is ridiculous we didn't have an office we weren't a big enough company this was essentially us um you know manipulating uh the, the, the manipulating our way to get in there and eventually that same person ended up being a decision maker for another bigger project many years down the track that he remembered who we were at that time and because of our reputation of what we did he believed we were still the same types of people that would that would extend reality and and stretch uh the truth to try and win a job, right? 
and uh, and ever since it's been a big realization that that you, your reputation is worth way more than money. It's it's in, it's to commit. You can lose every job in the short term if it means it strengthens your reputation. The short term money loss, if you can withstand it to improve your reputation for the future, is going to be worth a hell of a lot more than all of those jobs that you have lost. So with that, I. I wrap up. That is the entire framework, and I hope that uh, that was valuable. I hope that helps you make better decisions when you look at your own business opportunities and where you're looking to go uh, in the future. And uh, thank you for giving me the time to get up here and to talk to all of you.